75 years ago, as war raged in Europe and Japan, delegates from all over the world gathered in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to build a new global financial system. Through their creativity and collaboration, billions were lifted out of poverty all over the world, and the American middle class was created. But nearly a century later, it's time to recognize that the global economy has changed. We need a new system, one that builds on what worked, free markets and free people, and changes what doesn't. We need a new path for the future of capitalism. So countries can heal fractures within their own economies. From excessive inequality to job loss from technology, we need to win the race for the future of money. The rise of digital currencies, the long-term health of the euro and the dollar. We need to harness all the tools of economic statecraft, from using sanctions and trade policy wisely to reining in financial crime. Most of all, we need to remember what they knew in 1945. Economics, finance, and foreign policy are all part of the same story. This is a time to restore and rebuild America's collaborative economic leadership. This is a time for geoeconomics. Good afternoon. I'm Josh Lipsky, the Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. Thank you all for being with us today. And we're very excited this afternoon to launch new research, nearly a year in the making, on cybersecurity and central bank digital currency. Now, why this topic? At the Geoeconomic Center, we have made understanding the rise of digital assets a core part of our work. Now, many of you are familiar with our Central Bank Digital Currency Tracker project. Last month, we published a major update to our interactive database, showing that 105 countries representing 95% of global GDP are now exploring a central bank digital currency, a CBDC. And as we presented this research around the world, to finance ministers, to central bankers here in Washington, one question came up over and over. If we build a central bank digital currency, how can we make sure it is safe from cyber attack and protects privacy? So we got tired of saying that's a good question. And we decided to both better understand the problem and then recommend solutions. And that's the genesis of today's work and why we are here. We hope this report becomes a blueprint for action both here in the US and around the world. And we hope that it shows, as is so often the case in digital currency, it's important to separate the myth from the reality. So let's get to it. We have an amazing panel of experts with us this afternoon. Before we turn to them, however, I want to give the floor to Carol House. Carol is the Director of Cybersecurity and Secure Digital Innovation at the National Security Council. And that title doesn't even fully capture the extraordinary leadership role she has played at the White House and throughout the administration on these critical issues. So Carol, I want to quote here from the President's executive order, which we have all kept in mind during the writing and research process. With respect to digital assets, the administration will seek to ensure that our core democratic values are respected, consumers, investors, and businesses are protected, appropriate global financial system connectivity and platform and architecture interoperability are preserved, and the safety and soundness of the global financial system and international monetary system are maintained. With that, Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that, Josh. I'm thrilled to join you all here today as part of this exciting announcement um, about critical research on the challenges around cybersecurity and privacy and central bank digital currencies, all of which are critical priorities for the Biden-Harris administration. Um, first, I'll just highlight that innovation is part and parcel of the American economy. It drives how we generate jobs and, uh, and opportunities, how we seed and grow new industries, um, and how we maintain global economic competitiveness and leadership. We are the home for groundbreaking innovations in fields like computing, energy, finance, emerging technologies, medicine, even the forerunners of the internet. However, responsible innovation does not mean unchecked technological transformation. Privacy breaches, data misuse, and misinformation have demonstrated how important it is to continue to protect Americans and U.S. national security by accounting for democratic principles, protections for U.S. persons and businesses, and critical controls and technological innovation. 
In that spirit, we really appreciate opportunities to partner with industry, uh, academia, and international partners to address key issues like cybersecurity and privacy, as are the focus of the research being announced here today. And so I'll just give a little bit of a brief overview on how the administration is prioritizing cybersecurity efforts, the critical touch point that that has with CBDCs, and then also just some of our work related to digital assets. So first, recent events and major incidents like solar winds, Microsoft Exchange hack, Colonial Pipeline, Log4j, all of these make it very clear on the need for action to improve the cybersecurity posture of federal networks, but also critical infrastructure. And any future potential CBDC systems would certainly count um, as part of that critical infrastructure and need to account for measures that we need to put in place to better secure the integrity of uh, our software supply chain. So the threat that we face is fast moving and constantly evolving and growing in sophistication. Um, the public and there are public and private sector entities that are constantly under sophisticated malicious attack and unseen probing attacks from nation state adversaries, um, as well as non-state criminals. Um, most recently, the, the president also recently warned about the potential that Russia could conduct malicious cyber activity against the United States, and we continue to reiterate those warnings to U.S. critical infrastructure. So in light of all of that, it's really critical to, uh, to continue to examine the potential risks that come to play in cybersecurity, privacy, and resilience for CBDC systems to make sure that those me appropriate measures are in place so that we can leverage the greatest possible benefits that CBDC systems could potentially have to offer. So related to CBDCs, you know, interest in them has grown out of this burgeoning digital asset market, all a part of this you know, continued shift um, and growing digitization of finance and commerce that have been happening over the past few decades. Um, just, last, just last year, there was a $3 trillion market cap in the, the digital asset ecosystem, although there's also a significant fluctuation currently happening in the system that continues to point to why the different fundamental principles in the EO are so important to make sure that there are proper prudential market and consumer protections in this space. Digital assets, like any other form of technology or financial system, can be exploited and targeted by illicit actors. Um, and a lot of that depends on the vulnerabilities that exist there that can be exploited, as well as the potential benefits that they can reap, all depend fundamentally upon the different design choices um, that are made for the technology, the operation, and the governance of these systems. We need robust protections. We also need to confront how our financial system has and has not worked for certain consumers um, and ensuring that we have access to services that are equitable, inclusive, and efficient. That's why in the U.S. we are placing the highest urgency on the research into the merits of a possible U.S. central bank digital currency, continuing to build off of the many years of efforts being driven out of the Federal Reserve. A U.S. CBDC uh, you know, continues to build off of, um, off of other work that other nations are doing, like Josh spoke to before, of around 100 nations that are exploring CBDCs um, and could bring possible benefits like lower transaction fees, driving financial inclusion, and continue to reinforce U.S. leadership in the financial system. But none of that works without reinforcing the importance of cybersecurity, privacy, and other democratic principles into these systems. A U.S. CBDC is not an authoritarian CBDC and will not operate as one. Um, I, I will highlight that the, the G7 announcement of the principles for retail CBDCs last year was most welcome, focusing on key issues like data privacy and security, um, on operational resilience and cybersecurity, competition, uh, monetary and financial stability. Um, all of those great principles are the kinds of things that the United States will continue to integrate as we explore whether a U.S. CBDC is in the nation's interest and then look at and try to examine the different types of design choices that go into it. So uh, anyway, thank you very much for allowing me to make these remarks. Uh, very excited for the panel to examine some of the key issues related to, uh, related to the design choices and technology and governance that we need to account for in looking at CBDC developments in the United States, as well as working with our international partners. Uh, very excited to listen to the rest of today's panel. Carol, thank you so much. Thank you for being here today, for your leadership on these issues, and for those opening remarks, which I think framed what we want to do here today perfectly, talking about the road forward on the president's executive order, the challenges weighing the risk benefits of a CBDC. We look forward to continuing to work with you in the days ahead on these issues. Thank you. Thank you.
So now I have the pleasure of turning to our distinguished panel, and I will introduce them. So first, Julia Fonti, who is Assistant Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Carnegie Mellon, uh, one of the lead authors on the new report, and a senior fellow with us at the Geo Economic Center. We have Niha Narula with us, who is the Director of the Digital Currency Initiative at the MIT Media Lab, and one of the leaders around the world on these issues through her work at MIT. So many look to the work she does on Project Hamilton and with other central banks. And Mike Moser, General Counsel Espresso Systems and former Director of FinCEN at US Treasury. So we have the perfect panel here to discuss the technical elements, the policy elements. And Julia, I'm going to turn to you first, if that's OK. Here is the report, hot off the presses. We'll share it with everyone as well in the chat. So what I really wanted to ask you as we approach this subject matter and thought about it, you know, we have said, Carol talked about this, CBDC, they come with cyber risk. That's often said, the House of Lords in the UK said this in their inquiry. We wanted to explore, what does that actually mean in practice? What are the cyber risks? And so I'm wondering for us if you can explain a little how you approach that problem from a research perspective, maybe what surprised you, what risks are real, and which ones are overstated. Thanks a lot, Josh. Pleasure to be here. Um, so in terms of the approach for this article, we wanted to take a systematic approach of first really defining what kinds of threats we're worried about. So this involved delineating both what kinds of actors are going to be involved in a CBDC, uh, what their capabilities might be, and what their motivations might be, as well as what kinds of properties we want a CBDC to satisfy. And we focused here really on properties that we think could see some difference with respect to the traditional financial system. Uh, then based on these, this framework of thinking about the problem, we looked at various CBDC design variants and tried to analyze each of them with respect to these uh, security and performance properties that we want them to satisfy. Uh, so the report goes through for a number of different CBDC designs, uh, what are the different trade-offs in terms of security and performance for different types of threat actors? Um, and I would say there, there were a number of uh, key findings that we really took from this report. And I think one of the most important ones is that the design space for a CBDC is actually very broad and maybe broader than we typically think about. Um, so, of course, there are traditional uh, designs that we've been seeing popping up, but also there are new variants that make use of, for example, privacy preserving technologies that can enable functionalities that, um, that might not otherwise be possible. Um, so the first point is design space is very broad. Um, the second one is that when we think about the interplay between privacy and security, often these concepts are kept kind of separate. Um, but actually we notice that there is a, a tight interplay between these in the sense that if you build a CBDC that collects information about everybody's financial transactions in a nation, um, that database becomes a very high value target. And so when we think about risk modeling, it's important to think both about how well protected is your system, but also about how high value is the target that you're trying to protect. And so by building this kind of really high value target, we're potentially increasing uh, security risk as well by creating a target, not just for abuses by a central bank, but also uh, by external hackers. So I think this is an important theme that kind of pervades, uh, pervades the article. Um, and then finally, um, we wanted to highlight that a lot of these designs come with new cybersecurity risks, which are not maybe new in the security community, but are uh, Kind of, uh, haven't been seen to the same degree in the financial system. So for example, CBDCs that rely on distributed ledger technology uh, may need to worry about risks related to the authenticity, the availability and integrity of, of validator notes, for example. Uh, and so these are issues that we talk about in the paper at, at length. <laughs> Julia, thank you. And I, there's so much to unpack there. I want to talk more about this supposed trade-off between cybersecurity and privacy. But as we say in the paper, that's really kind of misconstrued in many ways. And there are ways to make these things safe from cyber attack and enhance privacy at the same time. And we'll talk about that today. And Neha, I want to turn to you next. You do so much work on this issue through Project Hamilton and now through other central banks as well. And I wonder in your conversations and in the models you're building, how often cybersecurity comes up 
and how you're thinking about approaching the problem. Thanks, Josh. And it's great to be here. And it was it was really wonderful to read the report. Uh, so I think cybersecurity is paramount when thinking about something at the scale of a national retail payment system. It's obviously one of the primary concerns, especially considering how vulnerable a lot of our national infrastructure is today and how we need to think about that and make sure that we're putting in place best practices to keep that safe. So I think, as you've already said, uh, there are some unique things that come into play when you're thinking about central bank digital currency and new sort of models that are introduced that cause us to think about cybersecurity in a different way. But then there are also a lot of pretty well-known security risks as well, uh, thinking about users' computers getting hacked, um, keys getting compromised. These are uh, risks and concerns that the security community has been dealing with for decades and has been uh, working on techniques and solutions to try to mitigate some of these things and to and to really um, you know make sure that we can build safe and secure uh, hardware and software. Uh, I think one of the more interesting uh, things that come into play when we think about something like a central bank digital currency um, is the is the fact that we're talking about uh, an iteration to our existing payment systems, which right now are primarily, at least the, the central bank managed infrastructure, primarily only available to financial institutions, which is a limited set of actors. And we're, we're thinking about moving to a world where users might interact, um, uh, if not exactly directly, at least much more closely with this payment infrastructure. And so that introduces a, a new level of scale. Uh, in addition to that, um, most of the conversations we've been having with central banks about um, central bank digital currency usually involves considering the idea of offline payments. And the solutions for offline payments will probably involve secure hardware of some form uh, and in some place in the payment flow. And that also introduces new and interesting challenges, especially thinking about um, uh, the supply chain of this secure hardware, how it's manufactured, um, who has uh, the ability to affect the way that secure hardware operates, who controls that. So lots of really interesting new challenges in addition to uh, challenges is that uh, I think the security community has, has already been doing a lot of great work um, and we just need to kind of bring it to bear in this new area. Thank you. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought up those two points because first, as we say in the paper, you know, not everything is new here. We secure the payment system currently. It's a top priority, as Chair Powell said, the number one priority. I'm sure that's one in one with inflation in his mind, but the number one priority for the Fed protecting the system. So we do a lot now, and it's about what needs to be translated into this digital asset space. And then the offline issue, which I'm really glad you highlighted because this comes up so often in conversations and presents new challenges as you raised. So Mike, that's probably a good transition to you. You know, you've been on the other end of this looking at the illicit financing side from your role. And we've discussed here there are a range of countries exploring CBDCs and different design models. And I'm wondering, putting your old FinCED hat on, how you think about all these different models proliferating around the world. You know, how you think about ensuring compliance through CBDC, through offline payment, stopping illicit financing when we have no international standards right now. Yeah, thanks, Josh, and, and great to be here. I mean, the the paper is, is absolutely incredible. And I think laying this out and getting into a lot of this and, uh, and to the directly to the question of what I'm thinking about it from a FinCEN perspective is uh, two two key issues, I think. And the, the paper gets into a, a lot of this well on the digital identity aspect, um, which is having interoperability and standard setting on what's the information that's going to be flowing across borders potentially about people um, and I think that involves a lot of different things. Like Julia talked about the, the ability to interoperable, interoperably share information from a communication standpoint and protect it. Um, and so I think that's that's going to be a piece that's that's critical from a technical perspective and a privacy and a security perspective, um, which which is partly what's I think wonderful about the paper and putting those together. And that's something that that we looked at from a financial intelligence unit perspective in terms of not just sort of collecting data on people, but that the actual mission was to prevent victims, uh, not just chase bad guys afterwards. Um, and I think that's what's gonna be key when you talk about the ability, as, as Neha mentioned too, to, to collect so much data about people to be able to protect that. Um, and so having standards about certainly the interoperability of it, but also, what's going to be collected and why and who's going to have access to it? How is that protected across borders? I mean, it's already an issue. Some of these are not new, as Neha pointed out. Like, There's already financial intelligence units around the world collecting various data. 
They have different standards for who can access them and when and how much data they collect. Um, I think you're right, Josh, to point out, like there's not a lot of standardization around that, which which can be pernicious to say the least. Um, the, not every financial intelligence unit of every country shares our democratic values. And, and I think that's something that we grappled with it from FinCEN, even when you'd have a country that would make requests through Egmont and, and other channels saying, can you tell us about this person? They, it seems like they went to your country and, and you'd be thinking, wait, they're sort of a political dissident uh, promoting democracy. Do we want to send that over? Um, and I think as the paper point, rightly points out, there's certain protocols that can be built in in terms of privacy in 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 the collection to begin with and then what it takes to reveal that but i think to your good point about standardizing to some degree across we also don't want to have weak points somewhere else in these cbd systems where you can okay i can't get it from the us there's there's they're super uptight about democracy stuff I'm going to head to China because um, I think the person traveled there and we're going to get all sorts of data on them over there. So I think, you know, the ability to collect an enormous amount of data and, and we'll talk through all the protections and, and optionality that's that's in the paper uh, as Julia laid out. But I think having some sort of standardization as we're talking about, not just sort of FATF thinking, here's all the data we can collect uh, to, to chase crime after, but how do we prevent the exploitation of people, and, and importantly, even the chilling effects that can come from that sort of data collection. Yeah, no, I, I'm really glad you said that about, you know, one, the standard setting and then the U.S. role here, because what we've done in this paper, and folks said, well, why take on both at the same time? We do the technical deep dive in the paper that Julia led with her co-author, Kari, and then we do the policy side. And we think it's important to marry those up because we have this roadmap in the paper about steps Congress can take and the administration can take and we all know how influential that would be around the world if some of these were taken on in terms of a standard setting agenda. So, but maybe that's a transition back to you, Julia, because we just talked about what should happen, but the paper also looks at what is happening. We do case studies in Jamaica, Nigeria, other countries, South Korea that are pursuing CBDC and much further along than the US. And I think it'd be useful to get an evaluation from your perspective are countries following some of the prescriptions we have in this paper? If not, what design models are they choosing and what risks are inherent in those? Yeah, so as you mentioned, there's a lot of really great work going on uh, right now with existing CBDC pilots around the world. I think two of the main types of designs that we're seeing emerge are either centralized databases or uh, distributed ledger technology-based designs, uh, so blockchain-based designs. Um, and I think one thing, it's been not enough time really to evaluate whether one design is uh, better than the other in terms of security. Um, but I think one thing that was interesting to see as we were doing this research is that a lot of governments are, or a lot of central banks are actually partnering with private companies to help with the development uh, and deployment of these CBDCs. Uh, and so I think one really important question to ask in, in those situations is, it, is to ensure that we have transparency or that at least the citizens of the country have transparency into what protocols and um, what designs are actually being implemented uh, in part to enable evaluation of the design, but also in part to provide modularity and prevent vendor lock-in. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, when I think about the, the private sector entities that are building the CBDCs, it's important to have transparency around them. And it's important to understand their relationship with a central bank or a finance ministry, because those finance ministries can ask for certain things that be built in, backdoors, other things to, to look at data. And without international standards, coming back to that point, I don't think these private companies have a lot of room to stand on to say, well, I can't do that. They can lose the contract and not do it. Uh, but there's not a lot they can go to to say, well, look at the G20, look at FATF. You know, if you want to be interoperable with the dollar, you shouldn't do this. That's what's missing right now. So Neha, when I think of the paper and I think about things that jumped out at me, there's this line that we have in there, privacy preserving CBDC designs are not only possible, but also come with inherent security advantages potentially that may reduce the risk of cyber attacks. And when we went through the editing process, folks who aren't in this world flagged that. They said, well, what do you mean about that? And can you explain that? And so you've done so much work in this space, Neha. I wonder, one, do you agree with that assessment? And two, if you agree, disagree, how you unpack the trade-off, if there is a trade-off between the two? 
Yeah, I 100% agree with that assessment. And I thought that was a really nice point that the paper made, which I think uh, isn't really talked about enough. And we had a, a line or two in the um, in the paper we released in February about Project Hamilton that I think alluded to this, but it was really great that your paper really drew this out and made this uh, an important point, which is that the best way to secure data is to not store it at all. That that is that's the best way to make sure that data isn't leaked is to either not collect it or to not store it, and often privacy preserving designs, especially ones that are designed using cryptographic protocols, have that goal in mind of not even seeing the data in plain text or clear text, meaning that even if the system is compromised in such way in in some way, because it doesn't even receive plain text data it can't leak that, that data. Um, and because of what we've seen in cryptocurrencies and other work in cryptography, we know how to still securely process payments, even if we don't see that data in clear text. And so I think that's a really powerful point to make. It's, an, it's really important for policymakers to keep this in mind. And I've seen something like this echoed in the conversations that we've had with a lot of central banks, which is they don't want to become a centralized database full of sensitive user information and sensitive user financial transactions. They would rather not have that data at all. Uh, and so I think it's important to note that we know how to design systems where we don't have to store that data. And the point that you make in the paper, which is an important one, again, to emphasize, is that this is actually good for security as well. So Neha, from the models that you're building with Project Hamilton and others, how do you implement that idea? Is it through Tiering, is, is that one way to do it? But how do you approach that problem if you want to, as you say, the central banks don't want to house all this data, but at some point have to be involved in the process, whether depending on the system and the ledger? Yeah, the way that I think about it is that there are different uh, layers to the system. And you can think about the core transaction processor. The core transaction processor uh, maybe is responsible for the most important functionality in the system, making sure that um, money is is processed correctly and payments are processed correctly. And that core transaction processor doesn't necessarily need to see a lot of sensitive data. And in fact, in the work that we did in Hamilton, we showed that that core transaction processor can see very little uh, data about the transaction actually. And there's even further we could go that we just haven't gotten to yet and is part of the later phases of research we're, we're doing where you can even reduce the amount of information that that core transaction processor sees. But what is very important to note is that there are layers outside the core transaction processor as well. And I think we're still in early enough stages of central bank digital currency design that it remains to be seen what parts of those layers might be run by a public sector entity versus a private sector entity. And so we can think about data being distributed across these layers, or maybe just having data at the edges of the system as opposed to embedded in the center of the system. So that's the way I like to think about it is, can we push not even just data, but even functionality to the edges of the system and keep the core of the system uh, pretty simple, secure, and uh, in, in, in a way where it doesn't have to see a lot of data. That's, that's really helpful. I think that's a useful frame to think about it. And I'm glad you said also that it's early because that should be a call to action for all of us that we can shape this through the work we're all doing together and influence it in a, in a safe and secure way. So Mike, I, I want to talk about this privacy issue and thinking about what Vice Chair Brainer said when she testified a few weeks ago on this issue. She kept saying digital analog to cash, which we hear a lot about CBDC. And we talked about offline payments. That's one way you try to make it a digital analog to cash, secure hardware. So, But obviously, there are differences when we think about cash and CBDC and how you would use it and access it, accounts otherwise, depending on your method. But in cash, and we talk about this in the paper, you have this $10,000 threshold in terms of where different regulatory compliance comes in. And so I wonder from your previous work, does that make sense to apply into the CBDC world? Technologically, we could think how to do it, but from a regulatory perspective, does that sort of frame make sense? And how do we ensure other privacy protections are built into the regulatory and oversight process? Yeah, thanks, Josh. I, I think it's I think it's really important that we're building in at least as much privacy uh, when we talk about an analog from the fiat, uh, from the the non central bank digital currency world, from what we've been using thinking about with cash, um, for a couple of reasons. And I think it's 
first, it's it's on the one hand, yes, I do think you, you certainly don't want less uh, privacy, um, but for based on all the data collection that that is laid out so well in the paper and the vulnerabilities created by that, um, we certainly don't want to be be getting less below those thresholds. And I think it's also important one from a security standpoint, but it's also from an adoption standpoint. Um, I, th- I think Carol House from the, the White House, like very well laid out, a, a U.S. CBDC is not an authoritarian CBDC. Um, and if you're not going to take a top-down approach that just says nobody can use cash, you can only use this, um, then it, that it needs to be attractive in in protecting people from all the vulnerabilities of a database collecting phenomenal amounts of mer- information about people, but also in ways that might chill regular democratic activity, including who did you donate to? Um, there could be First Amendment issues with that, uh, e- even the right to, to assemble. Um, who did you, are you a political journalist who, like in the earlier example about cross-border stuff, that you happen to be here in the US and a foreign financial intelligence wants information on you? Um, so there has to be a way that was always built in from a regulatory standpoint to say, we if this is a reasonable risk-based approach, and we think People can reasonably do certain activity without all of it being collected and creating the vulnerability and potential chilling effects that go with that. So if we take we take this together, these are the goals. I, I underscore what, what you just said, Mike, what Carol said, not an authoritarian CBDC. This is you know not what China is doing. There are 100 other countries pursuing CBDCs and 100 models right now. So what will the US model look like? But Julia, we don't come in the paper to an exact conclusion in terms of what the perfect model or ideal model is, but there are a couple of principles that we come around to. So I wonder if you'd just unpack a little, you know, if as you're outlining this, what you came as the conclusion in section two of the paper. Yeah, I think some of the main principles are actually not that exciting. They're, they're things that we have known and developed for a long time in the technology community. Things like uh, using well-tested technologies is often a, a better choice than going with something risky. Um, and what's what's nice is that even, even as we talk about some of these new cryptographic techniques and tools, uh, thanks to actually some of the innovations from the cryptocurrency community, a lot of these technologies have been tested uh, pretty extensively. So I, I think we can, we can pose principles where we try to use known and tested techniques and still uh, kind of push the envelope with respect to the the traditional financial system. Um, And and this holds not just for the ways that we secure data, uh, but also for the ways that we validate transactions, for example, uh, the ways that we manage keys, uh, the ways that we revoke transactions, and so forth. Um, Another important uh, kind of general finding was like we've been kind of hammering home over the course of this panel, is that uh, thinking with uh, privacy in mind or designing with privacy in mind is really important. Um, so the decisions that a CBDC makes in terms of their core transaction validation design are going to have long implications in terms of the the privacy that it's able to provide. Um, so for example, I think Project Hamilton has done really nice work in terms of architecting their system in a way that you can layer on uh, privacy protections after implementing uh, an initial design. And I think that's the kind of careful forward thinking design that is is really going to um, be desirable in this setting. Uh, and there's a few other uh, observations that we make in the paper as well, but I think, I think these are the main ones, which is really, um, thinking about well-tested technologies and thinking ahead in terms of what upgrades you might want to make to, to your system in the future. Everyone can read the full report and learn all the takeaways. Uh, but you brought up something, and this is we're getting a lot of questions on this, so they, I'll, I'll throw this to you. But then, Mike, if you want to jump in, cryptocurrency, stable coins. When you think about modeling, we're talking a lot about how these would work with either traditional cash as a replacement or a substitute, or with your commercial banking money as you have accounts now. How do you think about CBDC modeling and interoperability between cryptocurrencies? Is that something, Neha, you're thinking about in your CBDC design process at this point? Um, Absolutely. We're thinking about interoperability with with all sorts of different types of systems. So 
Uh, you can think about interoperability with the existing payment rails. So with commercial bank accounts, with credit cards, with ACH, uh, you can also, or, or even private payment platforms, you can think about interoperability between different CBDCs. So how to facilitate transactions more easily across them. And you can think about interoperability between central bank digital currency and cryptocurrency systems as well. I think that there are a few different dimensions to this question. Um, so in some sense, just by carefully thinking about uh, digitizing um, transaction settlement, you're already sort of helping with the interoperability question. And by making something that is available to people to use with digital wallets, that's already a step forward for interoperability. People can build applications that can move across that layer because this is being built in a way that is sort of programmability first or um, uh, digital first, digital native, if you will. But then there are other aspects to think about. For example, using cryptographic, compatible cryptographic protocols, like your digital signatures or your transaction formats and things like that. And then there's thinking about higher level ways of facilitating transactions across these things, um, sometimes even without requiring a trusted intermediary. So for example, in the cryptocurrency world, we know how to do things called atomic cross-chain swaps. And what that is, is, is there, it's a way of exchanging assets um, between people who have digital assets on two different blockchains or in two different systems. And we can actually learn something from that and think about, well, you know, what if we wanted to facilitate um, transfers between two different payment systems or two different CBDCs or a CBDC and a cryptocurrency? What is the minimum level of compatibility we would need between these things in order to be able to facilitate that? And is the fact that we're designing something as a CBDC, well, does that make this problem easier or harder? Um, and again, this is another area like privacy where we can draw on a lot of the work that's been done already in the cryptocurrency world, which can help us understand how to build these protocols uh, securely and efficiently. So I, I'm really glad you brought up atomic swaps. Uh, that's it's, it's something really important to talk about, and it leads perfectly, Mike, to what I want to ask you about speed, because we think a lot of the motivation of developing CBDC and potential benefit, reducing friction in the system. But from a regulator and oversight perspective, speed could cut both ways. And I wonder how you think about where the U.S. government is in having the technological capability on their end to do the appropriate oversight that would be needed if all these tools come to market, whether it's domestic interoperability between people's commercial banking and CBDC and crypto, or international cross-border. Uh, thanks, Josh. Yeah, I think it's it certainly would be a technical challenge at this state, but it's certainly uh, available in terms of the data, uh, the data capability of skill sets um, at somewhere like FinCEN, but but from a resource perspective, um, it's not there. But it's it's an area that FinCEN's been working on for quite a while in the traditional cyberspace with business email compromise as a rapid response program. But you're very correct that a lot of that relies on the ability to have the time that it takes for an international wire to settle which is uh, a staggering amount of time still at like three days. But that's a lot of time if there's a victim involved in a crime to be able to get to another financial intelligence unit, get to a bank and, and stop a transaction. But I think this is where all the incredible technical work that Neha's group's doing and that Julia looks, looks at in the paper is the whole point of this is an upgrade to the system. It's not just like one piece of it. It's, it's all this other um, all this other work that can be done, whether it's freeze keys um, that could potentially be used um, with discretion and all sorts of safeguards on it. Um, but, you know, taking a cue from, from what's possible already with Tether and USDC, um, there are ways to address this. And then I think on the other end, this goes back to preventing victims, not just sort of trying to chase bad guys to vindicate victims, is there's also a tremendous amount of risk management innovation going on in the private sector um, where there's automated and, and decentralized sensors, sensors out there that are uh, nodes that are watching smart contracts to see if malicious smart contracts are getting loaded with funds or getting ready to be operable and can freeze a smart contract before something happens, um, pause a pool um, where swaps would happen and, and, and slow down that process a little bit. And then obviously there's, there's more traditional escrow functions that could be built into it that could pause uh, and give uh, give some sort of time or a bit of a clawback period. 
That's really interesting. Okay, that gives us a lot to think about. So I think then, Mike, the follow-up to you is, what, what should Congress do? I mean, is this, is this a pilot? And that's an easy question to answer, obviously. But, uh, you know, is this a pilot project? Is that the next phase here to test some of this out? There's, that's obviously part of a heated political debate right now. But how do you move forward? Because it's not just about designing the CBDC itself. To what you're saying, it's designing all the complementing regulatory and oversight infrastructure that's needed in the implementation. Yeah, and I think, I think that's where it's having a proof of concept, having a test net um, that folks could use. And it could be, I mean, this is the private sector is doing this all the time. Like Espresso Systems is literally launching a test net uh, wallet tomorrow. Um, and, but this has already been out there for, for quite some time. You can get test net tokens from a faucet for USDC or Ether or others. And you can test things in private, make them increasingly public. Um, you know, I, Neha's group certainly could, could put this out, um, uh, fund and unleash them to, to create a test net that, that gets increasingly, increasingly more public. Because it's only through the resilience that you get from many, 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 many minds and many, many technical experts pushing at something to see where the, the vulnerabilities could be. But it's also what's the potential. Like the paper talks about all sorts of different thresholds that you could set in this, um, ways to, to limit whether data is even collected to begin with versus what it takes to reveal it later. You could set up multi-signature or multi-party computation ways that would totally dovetail with the policy aspects of, do you want it to be a subpoena required? If so, who, how many people have to sign off? Does it have to be a federal magistrate? Does it not, but it has to be an agency head, um, you know, who is accountable for those sig signatures that happen for something to be revealed, that sort of thing. And I think this space in particular is ripe for some sort of test net that people can get their hands on. And that includes policymakers to see what it really is. Like there's been so much debate over what wallets um, and, and what that even is, um, that having an ability for policymakers and technical experts to go in and, and use something and see what this is like, I think would be incredible. So I, I agree with you, and I hope that as this debate moves forward, these things are thought of together and not in silos. Otherwise, it, one will trail the other, and that will be problematic in the development. Uh, we have a lot of questions online, and please, everyone watching, submit. I, so I want to ask this one, uh, Neha, Julia, whoever wants to take it, or Mike can jump back in. It's about programmability and how you think about programmability and design, what threats that potentially opens or doesn't, and how you think about you know, user experience and programmability. I often find in my conversations of CBDCs, this is the secondary, but it's the longer term possibility of CBDCs that folks explore. Uh, so Julia, do you wanna start? And then Neha, I'll turn to you. Sure, yeah. I, I think this is a really exciting potential for CBDCs. Uh, especially as you said, in the long term. And I think one of the main risks that we need to be careful about with programmability is that, um, you know, smart contracts are just computer programs. They can have bugs. And if you deploy a smart contract uh, carelessly, you could enable uh, transfers of funds at a scale and at a speed that would not have been possible in, in today's financial system. So I think this places a really interesting um, burden of proof on the creators and the deployers of smart contracts to carefully test their contracts before deployment and roll out um, you know, careful deployment programs that maybe gradually roll out a smart contract, uh, as well as kind of accountability uh, policies for, for deploying smart contracts. Um, so I, I think it's a really powerful tool, but it's something that we have to uh, be careful about as, as we use it. Um, and understanding, and like we've seen in the cryptocurrency space, that uh, poorly crafted smart contracts can create a world of pain. Um, so I think this is a really interesting problem that we will have to grapple with. Um, yeah, I, I would add to that. I think that there are um, really important questions to address here and an area that is kind of connected, but at, but at the same time, maybe is a good analogy is that's important for CBDC designers to understand is um, uh, 
that of governance or decentralization. So uh, an important question that CBDC designers need to figure out is um, uh, how decentralized or, or who governs the system of the CBDC. And most of the large central banks we talk to are not interested in distributed governance or decentralized governance. That's not the way that they operate. Um, additionally, CBDC designers need to understand um, what level of programmability are they interested in supporting in the system and who has access to enable that programmability or implement features or um, submit programs, for example. Uh, again, most of the central banks that we speak to um, are, are hesitant or, or sort of would like to better understand what full programmability would enable. Um, central banks generally, uh, at least you know the ones that we've spoken to, have very specific mandates about what they are trying to apply to their economy. Um, and uh, you know, full programmability uh, open to everyone means that the central bank might end up running a decentralized exchange or a a, um, a game or um, or you know issuing securities and. You, you know, I think it's an important question for CBC designers and policymakers if that if they're really interested in the central bank providing the infrastructure to run those applications or not. That's that's a big open question in this area of programmability. That's that's really helpful way to think about the programmability challenge. And we think about the tension here between decentralization and a central bank. And it seems to me, and Julia, you looked at we looked at this in the tracker that the not every central bank, and there's definitely a split, but permission DLT system seems to be the, the sort of nexus of energy. Neha, is that what you see so far? And Julia, do you agree? I actually don't think we're going to go very far down the permission DLT route. I think that that's a temporary uh, design choice um, for the following reasons. So if, if you believe that central banks are not interested in distributed governance, then the permission DLT route offers fewer benefits. Um, it's really designed for distributed governance. That's the point of having many validators with, um, with you know, who who operate in different different realms. What we found in our work is that you can get a lot of the so-called benefits of DLT systems, or the things that are usually only attributed to DLT systems. In other ways, you can get programmability without using a DLT. You can get um, cryptographic signatures and authentication without using a DLT. You can even have replication and fault tolerance without using a DLT. Um, you can use cryptographic designs to help um, detect tampering and to get better um, performance to to get better uh, security guarantees without necessarily using a DLT. So. I, I think this that really we're just at the beginning of a journey into the design space. And the easiest thing for people to sort of start with were these permission DLT systems, which are often coming from uh, companies and communities where they are very helpful and there's a lot of resources and, and you know, they're willing to help central banks set up proofs of concepts and pilots. But um, and this is this is just my prediction. I don't know if this is going to be true or not. I think what we're going to see is that the challenges that come with using a permission DLT, namely the impact to performance and as well as the complexity of running the system, people will start to find that it's not necessarily a good fit, at least for central banks who are not interested in distributed governance. So, so then that begs the question, and Julia, maybe I'll turn to you, then do we come back to the premise of the paper about increased data collection? Because then Neha, are the banks themselves storing more data than they would otherwise? Or do you, is there a way around that? Do you mean the central banks or the commercial banks? The, the central, central banks? Right. The I, I don't DLT think, system. I don't think a DLT saves you from storing data. It actually increases the number of people who see the data. So um, I think we need to separate out this notion that DLT provides better privacy in some way. It doesn't. The technology that provides better privacy are cryptographic designs for privacy, which can be layered on top of a database or a DLT system or something else. Julia? Yeah, I totally agree with Neha. Um, another point that I, I wanted to uh, just emphasize that Neha made earlier is that I, I think there's a common misconception that smart contracts and programmability uh, can only be achieved through DLTs or through blockchains. And that's simply not the case. We can build in programmability uh, into even a centralized system, uh, and so that that's been touted as one of the one of the benefits of a CBDC, and is is not really connected to the underlying architecture. 
So, Mike, I want to turn to audience question here. You've been at FinCEN. What is the best coordinating body to do the international standard setting from your perspective? Because the questions we have here, are, this sounds right, but the technology and the country domestic adoption is far outpacing anything that's happening on the regulatory side or on the standard setting side. So is it, is it FATF? Is it the G20? Who, who should be leading on this? Because we know we have the G7 principles, but outside of that, I haven't seen a lot in the international standard setting front. And of course, the BIS does great research, but they're not a standard setting body. Yeah, it's a great question, Josh. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, maybe Neha and Julia, I think it might be my bet, actually, like, genuinely. Um, I, I'm always a little wary of multilateral bodies um, getting politicized a little bit um, or just um, sort of paralyzed by, by debate. Um, so I think to some degree, a smaller group um, might actually be a, a good way to start, uh, like the G7 with their principles. Um, like something, I don't know that FATF is the right spot because FATF is so focused on the illicit finance spot. And I'm not sure that they, they have the technical experts in house, um, that it's going to take. And I, and what I think is really important not to lose, which is what this paper and, and, and you all have brought together is the integration of the technical and the policymakers so that it's a genuine upgrade to the system that takes advantage of what's technically possible and also looks at the collateral impacts and for that, I think it's a, it, it, I mean, I'm sure we can look back to early internet um, bodies that married those two well um, and, and defer to, to Julia, and, and Julia and Neha on those. But, um, but I don't know that it's, it's existing things unless it's a relatively small group that really puts together technical experts and policymakers. Neha, Julia, did anyone want to jump in? I know... No one has a great answer to this question that I've heard, but I'm, well, I'm always asking, and we have audience members asking, so. All right, so it's an open question. That, so to all the multilateral you know, G20 folks, uh, BIS folks watching, it's an open invitation if someone wants to step up. IMF, my former colleagues at the IMF, if they want to take the reins. Um, Maybe. If, if I could just throw in a plug here, I think a lot of these institutions are probably going to either have to hire technologists or start to collaborate with technologists a bit more than they have in the past. Um, I, I, I think that would probably be beneficial, but I, I agree with you. There are a lot of these organizations out there that are coordinating standards, but um, you know, maybe they need to bring technologists on board to help um, coordinate technology standards as well. Seems like a smart move to do now, no matter what, that they should all be staffing up. The BIS has done this. I think the IMF has been a little behind, but is catching up now. Uh, and I just want to point out in the paper, you know, we go back to the privacy point. There's a lot of specific, you know, provisions in there that are worth exploring that we recommend in terms of what to do on universal searches and subsequent deletions. So I just wanted to raise that because there are questions about what specifically should Congress do. And it's in there in the paper that we put this roadmap out. And that's open for debate. You know, folks will agree or disagree with that. But we wanted to start framing the conversation. So I, we only have a few minutes left. And I want to make sure we get as many questions here as we can. But I just want to maybe as a kind of final round for each of you to weigh in on, on this broader frame. And it's, it's really this, and we've talked about it, but one, is it possible for a CBDC to be more secure and help deliver a more secure US payment system? And if we agree that it can, what is the best next step to take? So Julia, let me start with you. Uh, honestly, I'm very optimistic about this. Um, and I think one thing that people may not realize is that the current financial system, current banking IT infrastructure uh, has a bunch of insecurities as well. So in that sense, there's a, this is a great opportunity to uh, build a new system from scratch. Uh, and it doesn't inherently have to be more or less secure. It's really about the decisions that we make and the governance policies that we put in place. Um, so in that respect, I think some natural next steps are really to get a uh, pilot off the ground, as you alluded to, and have lots of technologists and policy people and uh, bankers, economists looking at the problem. You know, the more attention you shine on this problem, the, the more likely we are to iron out the bugs and uh, converge on a system that works for everyone. Mike, I'll go to you and then I'll have the last word. 
I, no, I totally agree with, with Julia. I think we need a, I think a pilot and, and dedicated technologists and policy makers together. I, I, Josh, you were right to put out this. I think this has done some, some really good work thinking through this and, and we've had conversations with them, um, with their technologists and they're pretty, they're well, really well integrated. So I think, I think getting a pilot going with, with like-minded democratic folks who want to lead. I mean, I do think it, I, maybe FATF and the UN and these other like massively multilateral bodies might not be the spot um, to drive this forward in, in the, in the way that we might've wanted the early internet to be driven forward in a, with de democratic principles. But I think the, as the paper points out, there's an enormous amount of op opportunity here to make it better in a more secure space um, that leverages so much technology to protect people on the front end and still do lots of sort of computations that are that are private. Um, but but it's also a potential to be a, a, an enormous amount of sur surveillance. Um, and I think it's really important that that the sort of liberal societies are leading on this, including with their technical experts. No, totally agree. Neha? Um, yeah, um, I'm pretty optimistic as well, I guess I'll say. Um, apologies for the siren in the background. Um, I, but I think it really, we're going to be, we're, we're going to have to take this privacy conversation very, very seriously and really design with that in mind from the beginning. I think as long as we do that, uh, we'll get to a pretty good place. Um, but if we if we don't take that seriously and, and we, we don't think about privacy right from the beginning of the design, then I'm a bit more worried with about securing data after the fact. But I am optimistic that we're at a good place now, as evidenced by this paper and this um, this panel, uh, to take these concerns very seriously. I'll, I'll also just say, you know, I, I think there might be a misconception. Technology doesn't stand still. Um, the payment systems that we're using today, the way they're built, are just not going to be the ones that we're using in 50 years. It is inevitable that there will be change. And I see um, digital currency development as a, as a natural part of that change. So in some sense, sort of asking, well, should we do this or not? Because we're worried about security is the wrong question. We're going to be building new systems no matter what. New systems are coming. New technologies are coming. The question is, how do we want to design them? Not if we want them at all. I think that's the perfect note to end on, the evolution of financial systems and payment systems and how we can do them in the best and safest way possible. Neha, Mike, Julia, thank you all for being with us today. Thank you for your expertise and your continued partnership and thought leadership in this area. We look forward to continue to working together. I want to offer a few thank yous to the many, many people who worked on this over a year. And so bear with me for just a second because they deserve recognition. So. You just met Julia Fonte, one of the lead authors for us, but I also want to thank Kari Kostinin, the other co-lead author, J.P. Schnapper Castro, a senior fellow with us at the Council, William Howlett, Josephine Wolf, and Ole Moore, senior fellow with us at the Council, who shepherded this project over the past year. Aaron Michelle Perry and the students at Columbia University who contributed their excellent research to it. Trey Her and Safa Edwards from Scowcroft Cyber Statecraft Initiative, who were partners with us throughout this process and the Atlantic Council Publications team, led by Susan Kavan, who did so much to make sure we could actually get this thing out and everyone could read it and enjoy it. I want to thank Costas Pentazopoulos, a member of our board who's here. I want to thank Ivy Lau, Usman Ahmed, and so many who participated in the process of creating this paper. And finally, I want to thank Carol, Niha, Mike, Julia, and I want to thank our GeoEcon team, many of here have worked tirelessly to make sure we could get this done today. Sophia Bush, Mugran Krasari, Ananya Kumar, Niels Graham, Maya Nikoladze, and the entire team who works so hard every day to make sure our future of money of work, all our work at geoeconomics, comes to you and is part of the feedback process that we hope impacts policy. So thank you for being with us. Stay with us at the Atlantic Council. Have a great rest of the day.